Welcome to Connected with Coast Autonomous with myself, Adrian Sussman, and Coast Chief Technology Officer, Pierre Lefebvre. Hello, Pierre. Hello, Adrian. Connected is a podcast series where we welcome special guests to discuss unique topics surrounding autonomous vehicles and self-driving technology. It's a pleasure to welcome back three-time Indianapolis 500 champion, Dario Franchitti. Hello, Dario. Hi, Adrian. And three-time 24 Hours of Le Mans winner, Alan McNish. Hello, Alan. Hello. So the general topic for this podcast is perception and prediction. I know from having been in road cars with each of you driving, it's a completely different experience to how us normal folk drive. You both literally have a 360 degree vision and ability to anticipate everything that are, that's happening. It's amazing. I know Pierre is desperate to download both of your brains on this topic. So let me hand over to Pierre to introduce this subject as it relates to robots and autonomous vehicles. Pierre? Yeah, thank you, Adrian. Uh, so um, welcome back, uh, Alan and uh, uh, Dario. Um, so the, the last time we, we discussed about uh, uh, general uh, autonomous vehicle, um, so as you know, Cost Autonomous is developing uh, uh, a technology to drive autonomously uh, vehicles, especially in uh, urban centers. Um, we are very, very interested to learn from you, uh, especially about perception. You know that on a, an autonomous car, we use sensors, but the sensor, even the best sensor, the most expensive sensor we have right now, have a range of 250 meters. It doesn't mean that they see everything at 250 meters. It means that they see a white car, but a black car would be probably seen at 150. And, and a, a pedestrian with dark clothes may be seen only at 60, 70 meters, which is extremely short. My feeling is that you feel blind like that. <laughs> but. What, what, what I think, I believe, but I'm, I'm not sure it's true, uh, is um, that you, racing car driver, have a very special way to perceive things. Uh, you focus on, as far as I know, long distance, and you have prediction, and you look all around. And I, I'd like to know exactly what, what you feel is the difference between a uh, normal driver like Adrian and I, <laughs> and you race car champions. Uh, so uh, I think going, talking about high speed, first of all, when you're at somewhere, and Alan, I think will relate to this with the speeds at, at Le Mans, but in Indianapolis, you're doing something north. I mean, your average speed is 230 something miles an hour. So your lowest speed, I think, in the corner is maybe 222 on a qualifying lap. So you're, you have to focus a long way in the distance mm. to give your brain the time to process what, what you're focused on. You look too closely in front, you, cannot, you simply cannot process it, no matter how much you practice. So you focus further ahead. But then you've got to be doing scanning as well. You're scanning, as you come to the corner, you're scanning that you, you're positioning the car to the apex and you're looking out again and you're, you're, you're constantly doing all these different scans from far away as far as, I mean, really almost half a mile away. You're looking as far as you can and then bringing that focus back up a bit more, maybe looking down a bit, up again, side to side. You know, you're having to, to process all these um, visual cues that you're getting um, as well as driving the car, as well as making the calculations in your head about risk assessment um, you know, when to make an overtaking move or when not to, when to lift because you know the gap is closing too fast because you want to get the momentum through a corner. So your brain is, is, is constantly doing that. But you're, I think driving on the, 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 the track is a much different thing than driving on the, on the road. I mean, Adrian and I, I was with Adrian in the car. Um, the day he said, he turned and he said, you know, driving the use different. And I said, well, what do you mean? Are you more scared or what's going on, Adrian? And he said, no, he said, you know, just watching the way you perceive um, dangers. And that's, you know, we can, we can talk about that to, in a minute, but um, you know, over to you, Alan, tell me about, about your experiences of uh, driving at high speed. I think it's very similar as you were saying. You're, you'd be very surprised and it's something that actually, Pierre, it's worthwhile you doing and the next time you're driving is just drive along in a country road 
but then think where you're looking. Concentrate where you're looking and you realize that you actually look to the apex and then you come back and then you look through the corner and you're always doing it naturally. But what we na do the majority of the time is we just narrow down our view. And as a racing driver, you clearly have to have a more of a 360 view of what's going on. And so therefore your peripheral vision is extremely important. And uh, that side of things is something that I think is, uh, it's something that's not necessarily understood the importance of the peripheral vision or how wide we can actually see. And so the wider you can see, the more information that you can take in. And Dario mentioned something there, and it reminded me of coming onto the straight at uh, Tetra Rouge at Le Mans and looking to the first chicane. The first chicane is nearly a kilometre and a half, two kilometres away. And you're going to be there in about 23 seconds. <laughs> but you come on to that and you immediately look to see what's there. Is there a car there? Is that car going to be in traffic? And if there is a car there, how far down the straight and where into the second or the mole sand corner are you going to overtake them? So all in all, it is a completely different picture to what you would naturally see in the road purely because of that excessive speed. But the skill set's still the same. I think the biggest difference for Dario and I is that when we're on the racing circuit, we don't have all of the other things going on. We've got racing drivers that we're racing against trying to beat, but we don't maybe have uh, the same distractions that we do on the road. And that could be someone telephoning, that could be the radio, that could be someone in the town just jumping out without necessarily looking. And those distractions are the risk in my feeling. I feel it's actually sometimes more dangerous driving on the road in towns than it is actually on the racing track at the speeds that we used to do. Yeah, oh, I, agree with that, Alan. I agree with that a lot. It's, it's interesting, you, you, know, you talked about on the road as well um, and that risk assessment. I did a, well, it was a speed awareness course, let's be honest. I, I, they were going to give me some points, so I went to a speed awareness course. Um, and I sat there and there was this thing, they said, okay, here's a corner. What are the risks? What are the, the potential um, hazards and so I said well there's, you know, I wrote, there's this there's this there's this and they said right read out your your answers and I went through my answers and I said oh yeah and there's that driveway on the left just over the crest you can see and he went what driveway I said well look there you can see that and he went we've never ever seen that before and that's mm -hmm. the I think that's the mindset isn't it Alan it's that focus of, of um, you know, you're going from extreme focus, maybe it's a braking marker or an apex point or something, but then you're widening out that focus again and looking for those, um, on the racetrack, looking for those um, potential hazards. And then on the road, it's a constant, you know, looking for the, those, the, the where, where's it going to come from? Is it going to be somebody running out, as you said, or is it um, a truck backing out or what's the body language? And one of the things I, I do quite a lot is I study the body language of the car that maybe I'm going to pass and is the wheel going to move or so if they don't indicate you can still um, take avoiding action and it's um, I think the most important thing I could say and the thing I've learned is whatever driving obviously on the racetrack but on the road full concentration if you're fully concentrated yeah. you you try to stand a much better chance of getting out of an, a situation that you've created but also a situation that uh, other people create and you have to, to avoid. Dario, you know, when I was racing at Le Mans, uh, a driver, we've got two eyes, we're looking through a narrow visor. And so you do have a restricted view. And we actually looked at developing uh, little cameras that sat above the driver's cockpit and looked over the front wheels to give a wider viewpoint. At the same time, we also looked at developing like park distance control, but a side sensor. So that when we were overtaking, we knew how close to other cars we were. Now, we didn't bring them to the race, as it turned out, because we found other solutions. But we're looking to do all of this because naturally, as a driver, you've only got a, a periphery vision that we sometimes don't use to our maximum effect on the road. But at the same time, we do have a lot of sensors on a road car that gives us that extra help. We've got lane assist, we've got uh, PDCs around the car that give you extra guidance. And, you know, we just need to think back five years ago where technology was and what we did and what we had in a car to help us and what we have today. It's just a different world. And what we'll have in five years' time again 
it's going to allow so many new things to come out. And that's, for me, a, a key point. It's not where we are today. It's where we're going to be. And uh, that particular road, I think, is a really cool one. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I like it. Um, I have a question for you. Uh, would you drive in uh, Monaco, in the small road of Monaco? How fast would you drive with normal car? Here? Yeah. Well, it depends what time of day it is. No, no, no. Oh, but if it's, a Grand, if it's a Grand Prix, then it was about 195 miles per hour. <laughs> but in normal, normal day life, then a little bit less than that. It's, it's a funny one here because... Uh, I do drive, um, but in general, because Monaco is so small, I tend to walk. Or, mm. you know, in that mm. respect, it's uh, it's a little bit easier. But they're they're a very advanced sort of system here in terms of uh, their new technologies. Electrification is a big thing. Prince Albert has been pushing this, and the environmental impact, and also you know how to try to ensure that Monaco is not just a, a nice place to sort of visit, but a nice place to live. And part of that is also the cars. So in that respect, uh, they're looking very much at how to bring in new technology to assist, especially up onto the rock, which is where the palace is, where the cathedral mm -hmm. is. There, they've got very limited parking. They've got, it's a lot of sort of traffic into that. And so they've been looking at how to actually improve that. And that's where autonomous, uh, slow moving vehicles. When I say slow, it has to be there because of the natural inhabitant. That's where it's a perfect situation for that. Whether it be for tourists or whether it be for the kids going to school uh, or whether it be just be for us moving around the actual principality itself. But if I'm to answer your question, if you're sitting in the traffic jam along the start and finish line looking at Santa Vot or going up the hill to Casino on your average day, you're still only probably doing about 25 kilometers per hour, maybe 20 miles per hour, somewhere about there. It's not fast. It's not racing driver fast. Okay. And Monaco is already uh, quite walkable. You, you can go almost everywhere by walking or, or going up the stairs somewhere. It's an yeah. interesting city in that uh, matter. Yeah, it's smaller than Central Park in New York in terms of square yeah. mileage yeah. and so it is a small place but then again it's one that uh, it it's a fantastic place to trial new things because it is quite closed and they're uh, quite forward looking in these things mm. agree and are you, are you how, how fast would you drive in a london narrow streets <laughs> when when i'm in in what they say a 30 zone or now a 20 zone, a 30 mile an hour, 20 mm -hmm. mile an hour zone. I am, um, I think it's changed a lot since my sort of first pass in my test mm -hmm. when it was sort of, okay, you can maybe get away with a certain speed. Now, when I go into an area like that, I'm looking as a parent, I'm now just looking, I'm looking for that, whether there's a kid coming out between parked cars. I was doing this the other day with Elias, and you know, you're going down a road like this, there's parked cars. There's a lot of kids on the thing. You've got to watch for one coming through. This is a, this is going to be your potential mm. hazard. So I now, yeah, if I'm doing thirty, it's it's yeah, that's a, that is about it. And it's just a, again about um, identifying those hazards and 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 trying to be as 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 good as possible. I'm not saying when I'm out on the open road up in Scotland and I'm in you know an old, mm. an old car of mine that I'm doing the speed limit, but when I'm in town. Yeah, it's a different. That's a different thing. There are so many hazards, and there's towns and, and cities have become busier. You just, you know, people on phones, people with headphones in, so they're they're listening to music or they're looking, they're texting as they walk along, or they're on their bikes, or there's you, the amount of different things that you've got to contend with um, are incredible. And to be honest, most people, I don't think, are processing. That, the information quickly enough or pr processing all the information they need to do. It's just, it's um, for Alan and I, you know, the training that we did, we've probably got half a chance, but um, normal people, it's very difficult. And as Alan said earlier, we're all fallible. You know, we all make mistakes too. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a busy, busy environment though. It's, it's incredible. The one interesting thing you said there is, and it was also one of the points I had was park cars. If you took away the parked cars that are actually sitting at the side of the street for the majority of the day without moving because they're only for the person coming into work, parking, 
and then leaving again. If you took that out of the equation, then you would actually reduce the risk factor quite considerably. Mm. So, you know, there's two solutions to that. You either have multi-story car parks, which are a fortune to build, but also then are space that uh, cities would maybe want to use for apartment blocks or people, you know, houses, that sort of thing. Or alternatively, you've got another system of allowing people to get in to the town. And uh, so in that respect, I think there is a, there's two benefits from it is a reduced risk, but also a cleaning up of the environment as well. That's right. Um, am I right if I say that you um, racing car champions um, are very good at focusing on something and being completely focused to what you do? If you ask my teacher at school, I would say definitely not. Yeah, it's cool. I understand. But when is your, your wife? Oh, hang on. I'm going to speak on Alan's behalf here. I've seen Alan do <laughs> this. And I said it, you know, when I'm doing the commentary on Formula E, I'll say it, you know, in his job as team principal, he's one of the most focused individuals I've ever met in my life. When he puts his mind to it, the level of focus um, is, is outstanding. And obviously to be successful in, in endurance sports car racing, you have to have that. And he's, he's got it. But then you combine that with the determination and it's a, it's a winning formula. But I think every driver has to have an incredible level of, of focus that we, let's be honest, we trained for that since we were 10 years old or younger. You know, we were racing from that age and it was, we were trained to, to focus. And if we didn't focus, we weren't going to win. If we weren't going to win, we weren't going to get to the next stage of the, uh, of the ladder and it was all going to finish. I think if I add into that as well, concentration. You know, talk about focus on a goal and things, but the pure concentration levels that you have to have when you're trying to be millimeter perfect at speeds of over 200 miles per hour, hitting apexes, trying to make sure the braking point, just think of it in a different way, 200 miles per hour, you're traveling at about nine meters a second. The circuit usually isn't nine meters wide. So therefore, if you're you know, a little bit late, sorry, 90 meters a second, I apologize, 90 so if you're you know a tenth of a second late then you're you've had an accident so you've got to be absolutely spot on not just for one or two minutes but in the case of how long's indy 500 dario it depends about three three and a half hours so concentrate fully for three mm. and a half hours which is the same as the stint for us at the le mans 24 hours in the car and trying to be quicker than everybody else and that's mm. very mentally draining now we're we're just focusing on that Whereas if you're in a situation, and some people do, they drive reasonably autonomous in a way because they're not actually concentrating as they're going from A to B. Mm. And that to me is uh, the actual risk point is because you are on an autonomous mental state, not in a heightened sense of alert. So, you know, when you let your guard down in a racing car, when we lose concentration, that's when we make a mistake. That's when we crash. That's when we do something silly. Mm. And it's the same on the road as well. Yeah, that's good. So, um, you know, with uh, um, um, driving assistance system in, in two cars now, uh, the car can sometimes drive by itself, uh, like on highway, it can follow the marking lanes. And, but when the car doesn't know, he's calling for the driver. And there are some studies that show that the best one to take over the car are the kids we learn to play to video games because what they, what they are good at, it's the exact opposite of focusing or concentrating, is they are able to catch anything coming from everywhere. And they are the best to take over the car, but they are the worst to drive the car by themselves. I'll tell you, I'll leave that one to you to do the test and development. <laughs> 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 but it is funny though it's that if you look at young racing drivers today because they have grown up on simulators and simulated systems then they're so much more developed than Dario or I were when we were 17 or 18 years old and in that respect they've got a different skill set as well I'm not saying that uh, they would have been able to survive in our era because it was a different type of learning. But mm. certainly they are, uh, in terms of their understanding and feedback and the way of working, then it is an absolutely different level. There's no question there. I'm still also thinking about my 15-year-old and sort of him taking over the controls. I would probably 
Uh, I'll, I'll follow Dario and we'll let, we'll let more testing to be done before, before that. <laughs> very good. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. I, I learned a lot just from this talk. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you. Thank you. That was a great discussion on perception and prediction. Fascinating stuff. Uh, thank you again to our guests, Dario Franchitti and Alan McNish. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the podcast and please join us again for more Connected with Coast Autonomous. <laughs>